Portugal's evolution as a nation is one rich in history and transformation. Once a maritime power that ignited the age of discovery in the 15th century, Portugal navigated the world, establishing a vast overseas empire that spanned continents from Africa and Asia to South America. This era of expansion marked the beginning of Portugal's deep engagement in global affairs. As the winds of change swept around the world in the 19th century, Portugal entered an era marked by decolonization and a shift towards democratic principles in international relations. This pivotal period reshaped Portugal's approach, transitioning from colonial dominance to embracing a more democratic foreign policy framework. In today's complex global landscape with pressing international conflicts like the wars on Gaza and in Ukraine, how does Portugal's past influence its current diplomatic strategies and engagements? To explore the Portuguese approach to the challenges of a modern and globalized world, Foreign Minister Joao Gomes Cravinho talks to Al Jazeera. Joao Gomes Cravinho, Foreign Minister of Portugal, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. Since we're sitting here in Qatar, let's start in the region with Israel's war on Gaza. Uh, sadly, Portugal has been directly touched by this, with three Portuguese killed by Israeli bombings and a number of dual nationality citizens still being held hostage inside Gaza. How are you involved in efforts to end the conflict? Yes, indeed. This is a tragedy that touches all of us. And in fact, let me begin here at Al Jazeera by presenting condolences for the losses that Al Jazeera has suffered, as well as other news agencies from uh, around the world. Uh, and this is uh, just a, a, a symbol of how uh, terrible and tragic all of these events have been. We have, uh, from the beginning, uh, firstly, uh, defended Israel's right to defend its territory and its population. Every country has the right, the duty, to defend its territory and its population. This is, of course, not the same as condoning, and we don't condone. On the contrary, uh, we do condemn the way that Israel has taken, um, taken uh, military action against uh, the population of Gaza. The number of civilians that have been killed in, in Gaza is uh, completely, completely unacceptable and does not have any acceptable military logic. So uh, we believe that the most important at this moment is to move towards a ceasefire as quickly as possible and or immediately would be our desire and to begin to talk because we all know that it is only through talking that we are going to make progress towards this two-state solution, again, that everybody knows is the only possible stable political solution. But how difficult do you think negotiations are at this stage? Uh, obviously, there was an initial release of hostages. There was talk of a pause in fighting. Those talks are now completely off the table as the uh, war has continued and it's appeared to widen. So what... Uh, fears do you have now for the hostages remaining in Gaza, firstly, and secondly, for the many thousands of Palestinians who continue to lose their lives? Yes, the longer war goes on, the more difficult it is to find the conditions for peace, including, of course, the release of hostages, including the alleviation of conditions for the population of Gaza that are uh, being, in many cases, absolutely uh, the risk of starving. And so uh, this is a situation that, for which there is only one way out, and that is to stop the military action and to uh, begin to discuss how we can firstly alleviate the conditions of the population, begin to feed the population, begin to house the population, and, uh, and then, once the humanitarian emergency uh, is dealt with, to look at how we can move to the two-state solution. The longer the bombing uh, goes on, the more difficult all of this is. The uh, International Criminal Court of Justice is hearing a case brought by South Africa of genocide against Israel. Europe's been, or the EU, has been silent on its stance towards this case. Where does Portugal stand on it? Well, to be honest, I think that the role of politicians at the moment is not so much to be bandying around words or legal concepts. It's really to push towards peace, towards ceasefire and towards a peaceful solution. 
the courts are there for good reasons. They will hear the case. We hope that the International Court of Justice will be saying, yes, please, this is mo the moment for the ceasefire before anything else. This is one of the, uh, one of the, the requests that is being made for immediate action in that respect. And it's immediate action that we have called for in the United Nations General Assembly along with so many other countries. So we hope the International Court of Justice lends its voice there. But uh, our concern at the moment is not this, most, uh, this question of the, the legal classification much more important is what is happening to people's lives on the ground. But what steps need to be taken to get Israel to stop bombing? Because nothing seems to be working where they're listening. The US, the EU, no one calling for a ceasefire is working. Well, I, I share your concern. This is, I've made this point to the Israeli former foreign minister, the former foreign minister, not the, the new one yet. And, uh, and I, I think that all of us in the international community need to be underlining that it is completely unacceptable. Unfortunately, we have instances uh, where in international, international order there is a complete disregard for law. And unfortunately, this is, this is one of them. Uh, last year, it was very interesting, the Portuguese parliament passed a resolution recognizing the Nakba, which of course was the forced expulsion of Palestinians in 1948. Don't you see the same thing happening now? Well, we have been very clear that there cannot be expulsion of uh, Palestinians from Gaza. There must not be. Now, we have heard, uh, unfortunately, voices in the Israeli government that are completely unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. Rather belatedly, we heard Prime Minister say that uh, this is uh, not the position of the Israeli government. But uh, it is clear to us that Gaza, West Bank, East Jerusalem, have to be part of a future Palestinian state. And therefore, expulsion of the Palestinian population from any of those areas is for us absolutely unacceptable. But is that not already happening, given that we're seeing one million plus people being moved from northern Gaza to the south, the majority of their homes destroyed or damaged? Are we not already seeing ethnic cleansing? And should the global community not be calling it as it is? <laughs> I don't think it is ethnic cleansing in the sense that, uh, in the sense of being expelled from their, uh, from Gaza itself. They, the population is in Gaza and it must remain in Gaza and it must return, must be able to return to, uh, to their homes, wherever they may be in that uh, part of, 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 of Palestine. And so, um, what we are, what we are finding though, is that Gaza is becoming uninhabitable. Mm. And that is, uh, again, unacceptable, and it is pushing the prospects for peace further and further into a remote distance. And so we have systematically appealed to Israel to stop uh, the bombing and to begin to talk about what is euphemistically known as the day after, mm. which should have been, of course, the day before. Uh, we've got Joseph Burrell saying that the world must impose a solution on the Hamas Israel conflict because he says 30 years have shown us that two, the two sides will never be able to reach an agreement alone. What do you make of that kind of language and what kind of solution could be imposed? No, I, I understand what uh, Joseph is saying. We had the opportunity to discuss in some depth. Uh, clearly, a long term solution needs buy in from, from the parts, from all of the parts. At this moment, what we are seeing is an absolute reluctance by the Israeli government to talk about the uh, prospect of a two-state solution. Is it totally valid, a two-state solution, with Israel taking over so much of the occupied West Bank, now with the situation in Gaza? Is a two-state solution really viable? These illegal occupations have to be reversed. Mm. This is international law. This has been established clearly by the United Nations, by Security Council resolutions over the time. And therefore, when we see uh, settler activity, uh, illegal and violent settler activity in the West Bank, we see it as being an, one more little nail that is uh, being put into the coffin of peace. And, we, and this absolutely has to cease. That is why in the European Union we are discussing the imposition of sanctions against uh, settlers who uh, are spoilers. One and of the unfortunately problems... supported by some elements of the Israeli government, and this must also cease. So one of the problems with the EU, though, is the divisions within it. Um, we saw that Portugal supported a United Nations General Assembly resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire, as you mentioned before, but a significant number of EU countries either abstained or voted against it. Does this risk 
the EU becoming irrelevant in this conflict if it can't present a united voice? Well, it's true that there are that the European Union is not homogeneous. We have 27 member states with different histories and different perspectives who on many issues around the world are, are quite united, but on this one uh, have been uh, three-way divided between abstentions and votes against and in favour. What we have seen is uh, that the votes in favour of peace have grown from 8 to 16 in the last uh, resolution. So there is now a majority in the European Union. Um, but there are some countries who, uh, for historical reasons, have enormous reluctance in saying anything that is not um, aligned with the Israeli government. I think that what we have to do uh, with uh, respect to this fact of life, of our different perspectives, mm. is to use it in our favor by saying that it can be a trump card because we can actually speak with different parties with um, amongst with using our different uh, our different perspectives yes. uh, you, you've said that uh, previously that portugal can be seen as a bridge builder uh, between nations do you see that being relevant here uh, how could portugal use its position in the world to yield results well indeed this is uh, it's not easy we have very good relations with countries around the world. We have good relations with Israel mm. historically and today we have good relations with Israel. We have a good line of dialogue. There has not been any break in this line of dialogue and that allows us to say to our Israeli friends um, there are areas where we think that uh, we, we absolutely diverge but we want to be able to continue talking with you so that we can help you to come to the negotiating table. We can help you to move towards a solution. Of course, with the Arab countries, we have a great ease of, of dialogue. And we will continue this. We are not interested at all in uh, breaking relations with Israel. If some have uh, proposed, some have said, some have done. For us, it is fundamental to be able to continue speaking with Israel. The trouble is Israel tends to uh, be very aggressive towards anyone that doesn't agree with its actions. We've seen this with the UN after the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who himself is a former uh, Portuguese Prime Minister, after he said that the October 7th attack by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum uh, and it cannot justify the collective punishment of Palestinians. That has put him at odds with Israel. What do you make of Guterres's leadership here? I think Guterres, uh, we're very proud of him. We are very proud of him. He has really uh, been a moral compass. Mm. With respect to here, allow me to say, I don't believe it is Israel that is against him. It is parts of Israeli society. Israeli society is rich and diverse, and there are many parts of Israeli society that are, would be very willing to sit down, engage in dialogue, move towards peace. So uh, what we have to be doing is saying that there are policies undertaken by the Israeli Defense Forces, under the command of the Israeli government, that are not acceptable and that are not conducive to peace. And these policies can be changed. And then it will not be just Israel that is changing. It is, it is the whole region that would be changing as a result of a different conception, different vision uh, of leadership by, by Israeli uh, politicians. Mm. Let's move on to another major conflict, uh, Ukraine. You've just received the Order of Yaroslav the Wise uh, in Kyiv for significant personal contribution and support. But are you concerned that international support for Ukraine is starting to slip as it moves out of the international headlines, as we see the Republican Party in the US uh, paralyze Congress, as we see Hungary blocking EU financial aid? Where does that leave Ukraine? Uh, yes, you're right. What we have been seeing is uh, politicking. Actually, uh, as far as I can understand it, in the American political system, the parties are aligned on the kind of support that, that Ukraine needs. But one party is saying that it will only give it if a number of other concessions mm. are made with respect to migration. Um, inside the European Union, we are having the same problem with one country saying that it wants to obtain other advantages in order to allow, allow support for Ukraine. And so uh, what we are seeing there is a failure of strategic vision by uh, elements in our political systems, uh, which are democratic political systems, which require the development of consensus. And we're finding this consensus being blocked because of advantages that can be obtained uh, on, on unrelated matters. 
really, I think that uh, there is, uh, I think, lack of responsibility, responsible leadership uh, with respect to this. And hopefully, before it's too late, that responsible leadership will prevail. Because do you think Ukraine can prevail against Russia if it has continued support from the West? I, I think so, absolutely. I'm convinced that if, if Ukraine gets the support that it needs, uh, it is capable of beating back Russia. Russia is, in many senses, more of a paper tiger. Of course, it has vast resources, mm -hmm. but we've seen how disorganized they, they are. We've seen how incompetent their military has been. We've seen how uh, they have been uh, incapable of... Uh, having control over the Black Sea, even though Ukraine doesn't have a navy. Mm -hmm. The Russian navy has been uh, forced to hide uh, at a large distance from Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian weaponry. So, yes, they can prevail. They have determination, they have, and they have justice on their side. And these are very powerful factors. They need the weapons, of course. And yet, the much-anticipated counter-offensive of last year didn't take off in the way that it was expected. Very little ground has been gained by Ukraine. So that would suggest that there's, it's not as easy as you would think. It's not as easy as supplying the weapons and supplying the financial support. They need, they need more weapons uh, in order to be... And they've, when they've uh, been... Uh, supplied with uh, the appropriate kind of technology, um, military technology, they have, uh, Ukrainians have shown themselves capable of using it. But this isn't easy. And in any war, if you think of the Second World War, the number of times that the front went backwards and forwards, expectations changed. Um, this, uh, this, this is a very complex war, but it is a war that Ukraine cannot lose. And uh, the West cannot lose it either, because if the West loses it, well, the whole world will be losing it because we will be ushering in a period of disorder. We will be ushering in a period in which it has been considered acceptable uh, for a larger country to run over mm. a smaller country for the most spurious of reasons. And I think that international order will be gravely damaged and this will have an impact in many other parts of the world. Well, later this year, we've got a, a very crucial election in the United States, which may well usher in a return of Donald Trump. That's going to change the situation quite significantly, isn't it? Because it's not going to guarantee US support for Ukraine. I think that uh, in, when, in the American political system, which of course is never one uh, single person, in the American political system, there uh, has to be a clear awareness of the strategic challenge that is being faced. If there is a failure in the political system to understand this, then, uh, then American leadership will be deeply affected and uh, this will have repercussions uh, in American standing in the world for many, many years. But do you worry that the EU relies too much on the US for its defence? Should it become more independent of the US in this regard? I think that around the European Union today, it wasn't the case a few years ago, but today there is a clear understanding that whoever wins the elections in November, um, in some years from now, European Union countries will have to stand up for themselves, will mm. have to be able to stand on their own. Because, and this may or may not be accelerated by what happens in November, uh, either way, by the end of this decade, we, have, we will have a situation where we need to be able to uh, assure our own, uh, our own defence needs. Let's take a look at domestic politics within Portugal. The Prime Minister, Antonio Costa, resigned in November. This followed uh, a string of members of government leaving their roles over allegation of corruption and past misconduct. It's forced a second snap election in two years. What does this do to Portugal's international reputation? Of course, uh, for, for all countries, it's good to have, uh, to have stability and uh, to have um, mandates that uh, reach the, the term of office. However, I, I would say here that uh, Portugal has an advantage uh, over, over some other countries, which is that we have a great con degree of continuity in our, in our foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever wins the elections in, in, in March, in a couple of months' time, um, people around the world will know that in 49 years of democracy, we have only had one occasion where there has been a serious division between the main parties on a foreign policy issue, which was the invasion, the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. But uh, this is the exception that proves the rule. The rule is that we don't have 
um, major differences in our foreign policies. So there will be a lot of continuity, mm. and then, then the electorate will choose whatever it uh, chooses in, in March. But one break in that is uh, Prime Minister Costa being considered the front-runner to replace Charles Michel as the president of uh, the European Council later this year. Is he now out of the picture? No, I think that uh, Prime Minister Antonio Costa uh, chose to resign because uh, he felt that his position as Prime Minister was not compatible with the legal investigation. Of course, if you are Prime Minister of a country and you are being investigated, there is a strong... There can be an idea that you can somehow interfere. He felt that it was incompatible with the dignity of the post of Prime Minister to be in that position and to be very took the very honourable uh, position of, uh, of, of, of resigning. This does not mean anything with respect to uh, other uh, situations, namely, namely the European um, scenario. He has been spoken about as president, possible president of the European Council mm. for uh, many uh, years. He has uh, always made clear that uh, his... Uh, domestic role was the one that was uh, the most important uh, for him. Of course, now the situation has changed. Let's see what, uh, what happens as a result of the discussions that are taking place now around the replacement of uh, Charles Michel. Do you see Europe shifting towards the far right? We've just had Gert Wilders winning elections in the Netherlands. More than 10 countries, including France, Germany, have anti-immigration groups topping the polls or coming a close second. Even in Portugal, you've got uh, the far-right Chega party, which was established only four years ago, now attracting 13.5% support. Why is there this shift across the continent? Well, I think that we really have to see this shift, not as a change in the people, the people are the same, mm. but as a really a, a, a wake-up call to the political classes that they need to be listening closely and responding to concerns. I think that the growth of the uh, anti-immigration lobby mm. is not so much about not liking... In Portugal, we don't have a very significant... Despite this party, we don't have a very significant anti-immigration posture. On the contrary, we need immigrants. We mm. have more and more immigrants, and we would like to have more in the future. But what we do have in Portugal and around Europe, of course, is a sense by many people that they are being left out, that they are being forgotten, and we need to be paying close attention, listening to them, and uh, avoiding that they should fall for the, uh, the this, this siren call of uh, extreme right parties that have no solutions whatsoever to offer. These are protest parties, and uh, that if when elected, will only bring chaos to, to the countries that, uh, that they are being called to govern. Well, they haven't, though, have they? Because in Italy, Giorgia Maloney's party uh, is doing quite well, by all accounts. It's interesting that uh, her uh, position has been to abandon some of the postures that mm. brought her to the power, power in the first place. So uh, that, I think, is a signal. And uh, Giorgia Maloney... One of the first things that uh, she said and her foreign minister, Antonio Tajani, have underlined is that uh, they remain fully aligned with the transatlantic alliance. Mm. Uh, they are completely supportive of uh, Ukraine. And so these issues, which some of the far-right parties, including in her own government, uh, the other far-right party in her own government, have been, have been using to try to uh, create divisions... Uh, because they thrive with divisiveness. Uh, these issues, once uh, she has entered office, she's been very clear, and that, I think, has been key to her success uh, mm. in, in, uh, in Italy. Let's move on to climate change, a key issue facing the entire world. You've just been at COP28 in Dubai. Uh, there, the conference called for a phasing out of fossil fuels, but the UN stock take report says that what was actually needed was radical decarbonisation. Do you feel there is a real global will to do what is necessary to stop a climate catastrophe? I, I had a pro professor at university whom I highly valued, and whenever we used the term political will, she would jump on us. And she would say, no, poli behind political will, there are interests, a lack of interests. And, and I think that's what we have. Mm. What we have here is an enormous difficulty of many countries in, um, in saying to certain domestic lobbies, uh, excuse me, but this is going to cost you. 
uh, it's going to cost all of us. And you're going to have to bear some of these costs because, uh, because we all need this for the longer term. So again, we come back to political leadership and the absolute need that we have of having some just burden sharing internationally, because that is what can give political leadership the basis then to go to the population and say, it's costing all of us and mm. we all have to do our part. So I think that COP28 was, um, was good, but not good enough. Mm. Uh, we, in these COPs, we are always finding a the balance between what is uh, necessary and what is possible. And uh, what, is what is possible has been falling far short of what is necessary. And so we really need to up the what is possible part. Uh, Joao Gomes Cravinho, Foreign Minister of Portugal, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.